I want to make sure that everybody has a, a worship guide. And so if you don't have a worship guide, if you put your hands up, uh, Thomas will help us out here and a few others as well. And we see there's some at the front up here and uh, right in the middle as well. And if we can get, uh, make sure everybody's got a worship guide, that'd be great. Keep your hands up as long as you can, about an hour, which should be fine. Um, that'd be good. Kevin, I'm glad that you're going to get a worship guide. That's good, man. I'm glad you paid attention as you came in. That's good. Good to see so many familiar faces, great faces. Good to see uh, some visitors coming and joining us for the weekend. And uh, great to see that Jeanette Bell is back in church. There she is. Sitting in a different location, so she may throw you off. Yes. She had this fake injury where she broke her leg. Um, and uh, I'm glad that it's healed and that she walked in today. She did ask me, though, to, to meet her at 9 o'clock to help her into the church. And I knew that I was going to be really busy, so I, you know, I contacted a few deacons and elders and said, hey, could you meet her at 9 o'clock? And they said, sure enough. Fortunately, uh, none of them were there. And uh, fortunately, Matt Soapman, who is an elder, by the way, an elder, he actually helped you in. And so that's great. I'm glad you're here. But we're glad to see you back at church as well. So it's fantastic. Um, we are in the middle of a great series. And before I dive into it, I wanted to let you know something that's really interesting. And maybe you knew this already. But that song that we just sang, Hosanna, did you know that Pastor Eli just wrote that a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, isn't that good? Yeah, absolutely. And the reason why you're singing it 4,000 weeks in a row is because he's tweaking it and getting it just right. It's going to be the song that we're going to use for the theme song for the One Project Gathering in Seattle. And so he just wrote that, and so it's fantastic. In fact, the entire team are staying here all day today, and they're going to be practicing all afternoon and uh, mixing sound and getting everything ready for uh, what the gathering is coming up real soon. So I'm really glad for that huge commitment. I see them come here at Sabbath mornings. They arrive here at 7.15 a.m., all on time, and they're even happy, um, which, is a, which is a miracle uh, because most of them are quite miserable people. But uh, no, no, so it's great to see that kind of commitment inside there. But as we has, have uh, enjoyed this, I also want to ask your prayers for this week. Um, on Tuesday night, we're going to have an elders board. And uh, we, we have a lot of stuff that we cover all the time at the Elders Board. But this Tuesday, based on the messages that we've been going through, uh, the process that we've been going through here, this Tuesday we're going to really delve deep into whether we are truly following the gospel that God has laid before us. And are we, as a church, as a healthy community, moving in the way that God has led us? And uh, I, w I want to encourage you to pray for us. We're going to meet from uh, 6.30 all the way through 9.30. Pray for us, keep us in your prayers, and if you've got ideas that God has laid in your heart as well, then please share them with us, but uh, Tuesday night will be an important night for us as we begin this process of trying to renew ourselves in the direction that God has called us to, so that'll be Tuesday night. The choir sang a beautiful song at the beginning of the service, um, in the need of Jesus in our lives, and I'm going to ask that we pray one more time, and then we're going to dive into Kings. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that uh, you are ever there for us. Before we even call on your name, you have already answered, and I know that we can claim that promise right now. We're desperately seeking to be able to be in your will. We're desperately seeking to be following your path. We ask for the clarity and strength in it. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So, we are in Prophets and Kings, and uh, my telephone number's up there on purpose. If you have a question throughout the entire reflection, uh, then you're welcome to just text me, uh, and I will address it sometime in the next millennia, but uh, you're welcome to text that. If you, that number will go away at some point, and you may say, what's the telephone number? Well, it's in the worship guide on the back, so there's no excuse inside there. The other thing that's really important is that you need to know that the Bibles in the pews are for you. They're for you to take home with you. They're for you to, to read this time. You can even write in them, and to help you to write in them, we provided pens today. Isn't that good? You see those pens there? It says Boulder Seventh Adventist Church. Get this. You can take the pens home. Yeah? I know. You're right. I've already taken it. Okay, that's good. Take one. Uh, take another one if you want to share it with somebody. But when you share it with them, they have to come back next week to take one. Hmm? It's a good deal. All right. So uh, but you're welcome to take that. Use the pens as well to write in the Bibles. Take the Bibles with you. Uh, thanks to a few people in the church who helped to fund that, then we're able to be able to share that with more people as well. We're going to use that text today as well. We are in Kings, and I, I just last week I asked you, and nobody knew the answers, or you were just really shy. So let's just make sure that we're right about this. The children of Israel are where? 
Hey, they're in exile. Okay, the front row is going to do really bad at this. They're going to get all the answers right. They're in exile, and they're in exile, and they're looking back on their lives, and they're starting to say two questions to God. They're saying to God, God, why? Why did you abandon us, or did we abandon you? That's the question they have. So the book of Kings is not really a history book, although there's a lot of history inside it. The book of Kings is there to do what? Transform us. That's for next week, just in case you forget that question. Transform us. And hopefully, it will also take the identity that you have in God, and it will reevaluate that entire identity that you have in God. That's what the book of Kings is for. So the children are in exile, and as they are slippery in exile, I nearly fell over. Thanks for cleaning the floor so well. Um, and so, it's a little bit shiny. And so they're in exile, they're stuck inside here, and they're looking back and they're saying, let's discover what happened with Moses. Let's discover what happened with the judges. Let's see what happened with the kings. Because for some reason, they were never satisfied with God leading them through the way that God wanted to lead them. So they get to kings and they said, well, we now have a king, we have King David. And then we get to the fact that King David dies, King Solomon comes along. He's not only dashingly handsome like his father, but he has a thousand different women in his life. And, and then he ends up following Greece and the Egyptians, and he ends up destroying the empire effectively. By the end of it, his children come along, and they split the kingdoms, and you have what we have, the north and the south. And the kingdoms are divided up, and the children of Israel are now watching the story develop. And as they do, we got to two weeks ago, where they were looking at the fact that the south had a king for 41 years, a little bit of stability, but the north, oh, it had seven different kings, including one that was only there for seven days. And then we get introduced for the first time to a prophet. No name, just a man of God. And the whole story unfolds a little bit further until God says, Ahab, you as king right now, you're doing far worse than Omri. It's just terrible. I'm going to have to bring a really serious prophet on the scene. And he brings a guy called Elijah. Elijah comes on the scene out of nowhere. Just phenomenal guy. Just turns up on the scene. And this guy does everything. He, God says to him, hey, tell him there's a drought. He tells him there's a drought. Go to the widow. He goes to the widow. Tell him that there's going to be a, a son to be resurrected. He resurrects a son. He goes and confronts the king on Mount Carmel, hundreds of prophets. He does everything that God tells him to do. The prophets are just worshiping themselves, doing all sorts of crazy stuff. God sends the fire down, consumes the entire altar. There's like a hurrah. In fact, they, send, they say these words. He said, he is the God. He is our God. He is our God over and over again because they're overwhelmed by the fact that they have discovered God once and for all, through the fire and the power and everything else. And Elijah is on cloud nine. He's up there really happy with everything going on. He even sees the cloud the size of the hand of the fist, and he says, Ahab, start going. The rain's coming. Declares the rain and runs faster than the horse and the chariot, which is something that I've never tried to do because I don't want to embarrass horses or chariots these days. But... He arrives at the scene, and we get to chapter 19 now, where something entirely different takes place. And it's kind of a shocker. And I, I, before I read it to you, I want you to, to turn inside your guides because you're going to need this first question. So you go to the recalibrate questions inside your guide here. Number one inside that says this. What repetitive messages from God are you ignoring? What repetitive messages from God are you ignoring? And I know you're thinking to yourself, maybe those messages are not from God. They're from somebody close to me. He's repeating them over and over again. Maybe it's messages that you keep on saying to your children over and over again. But in the Bible, when something's repeated, it's significant. So I'm going to read the story to you. It's just one chapter. It'll take me four hours. It won't be long. One chapter, chapter 19. It's actually page 207. So if you turn with me in your Bibles, because we're not going to throw that on the screen. Actually, could we hide that? For a second, Kayla, we just slide that back to some other slide. Yeah, super, thank you. Let's not show that slide, and you just imagine you didn't see it. See how that works? It's great. All right, all right, good. We're in 1 Kings chapter 19. I need you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19. If you have your devices, do that, but it's on page 207 in those Bibles in the pew. I'm going to give you a minute just to find it. And as I read this, I want you to ask yourself, what is repeated in the story? What occurs 
again and again and again, because there's got to be something inside the repetition inside there. Chapter 19, verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with a sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid, and he arose, and he ran for his life, and he came to Bathsheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake of bread on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Haziel to be king over Syria, and Jehu to be the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Meholiah, you shall anoint to be the prophet in your place." And the one who escapes from the sword of Haziel shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, every mouth that has not kissed him. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him. And he was with the 12th. Elijah passed by him, cast his cloak upon him, cloak upon him, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, let me kiss my father and my mother that I will follow you. And he said to him, go back again for what I've done to you. And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen, sacrificed them, boiled the flesh with the yokes of the other oxen, gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. So, what got repeated in that text, in that story, is really important. And I want you just to see this. So let's go to the next slide now. And in this slide here, I didn't expect you to read it, okay? Unless somebody's got like, I can read it at the back. I've got laser vision. You don't need to show off. Just stay calm. I didn't expect you to read it. But the very first one here, you'll see here that, and maybe you picked up on this as well, that Elijah talks a lot about the fact that he's fleeing for his life, that he arose and ran for his life, that he asked the Lord saying, can he die? And he said, take my life away. Take my life away all through the story for Elijah this point in his life is a matter of life and death, all right? Number two, what else got repeated inside there? God gives a question to Elijah. Let's throw that next slide up. God gives a question to Elijah, and he says to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And he says this twice to Elijah, and that's going to be important as well. Number three, listen to Elijah's reply when he has this question from God. He says, to the Lord, and he said, I have been very jealous of the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I, even only I am left, and they seek my life to take it away. God asks him the same question. He repeats word for word the same answer, okay? 
So he's repeating his answers to God, even though God asks him the question. And the last one, how does God respond to him? What happens there? There's three things that takes place. It says, but the Lord was not in. But the Lord was not in. But the Lord was not in. Now, there are two angles to this story. There are two messages deep inside the story. Guaranteed, there are lots more. But there are two big, broad messages. One is that this is about God's mission and Elijah's purpose. And that's an overarching message inside here. The second one, a secondary one, one that we're probably more interested in, more than God's mission, more than Elijah, uh, Elijah's purpose, is how does God communicate with us today? And we often focus on that more than anything else. But the story has those two elements. Lawrence Turner is a professor of the First Testament, Old Testament. And he's going to be here in May 21. Uh, he's going to do a whole weekend for us. So don't book any vacation at the time. Make sure you're here for this, May 21. This guy is in, you know, in Christianity, evangelical Christianity, there's a guy called Walter Brueggemann who is, for me, one of the best First Testament scholars out there. Within Adventism, within our tribe, Lawrence Turner is the Walter Brueggemann of Adventism. He's brilliant, published, lots of different places, but he's got some insights into the First Testament. And he's taught me this years ago, that there are three things that you should watch out inside the stories. Whenever you're reading a story in the Bible, and I encourage you to do the same as well, look for what is repeated. If it is repeated, it is important. If there is a point in the story, number two, that you get the idea that it says, and in his heart he said this, or in his mind he thought this, it's giving you an insight into the motive of the story. That's pivotal to there. And then the third one is that if you see the story pops up and you see a cross-text reference into textuality between this story and another story, it's significant. So, when you heard the story of Elijah, did it remind you of any other stories in the Bible? Moses? Any other stories in the Bible? Esther? Did you say Esther? Jonah? There are similarities inside those stories. The deeper ones, of course, would be Moses, and obviously Jesus as well. And we're going to find out what those are. But let me tell you just a few interesting things that come out here in the text when you're looking for the beauty of the back and forth, especially when you're looking at the text references back and forth. Do you remember when we talked about uh, the Queen of Sheba and how she came to Solomon and she brought gold and frankincense? And we said that later on, Jesus is going to be the king, the true king of the line of David, and the kings from the east are going to come, and they're going to bring gold and frankincense. There is a significant correlation between the two. It's telling you that Jesus is the true Messiah, and all the other people, the Gentiles, will recognize this as well, and they will bring the appropriate gifts to them as well. Same thing takes place inside the story here with Moses and Elijah. Moses was the guy who took them out of the bondage, now they're stuck in exile and they're like, man, if only we had a Moses here. And they're getting through the story and they like start to see Elijah is kind of like a Moses. And later on when you read about Jesus and you see Jesus on the mountain, who comes to comfort Jesus? Moses and Elijah, right? So there are prominent, significant correlations between these two characters here. Well, here's the correlation between it. And I'm not going to make you jump between the text back and forth today. But if you want to know what the texts are, we can go through, through these together sometime. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18. First of all is this. Moses goes to Sinai. Elijah goes to Sinai. It's called Horeb here, but it's the same mountain, Sinai. Moses goes 40 days in preparation. Elijah does 40 days in preparation inside here. Moses goes inside a cave, a little cleft in the rock. Elijah goes inside a cave, a little cleft in the rock. Moses says, God, may your glory pass before me. And Elijah says, God, may your glory pass before me. Moses says, the mountain shook, and there was all sorts of earthquakes taking place. And Elijah standing there, and the earth shook. You see the correlation. It's just bouncing back and forth between the two stories here. You have fire with Moses, and you have fire with Elijah. You have then what happens next? You have thunder with Moses, and you have silence with Elijah. And that's the break in the story. And the break in the story is significant because it's telling you there's something about to change. And this, we will come back to. But first, let's go to question number two. Question number two, which is a deep story inside here, is number two. What helps you handle your depression 
And who close to you knows this? What helps you handle your depression? And who close to you knows this? See, God says to Elijah, take care of the drought. Tell him it's drought. Got it. Check. Done. Uh, go and tell the widow that you're going to live with her and look after her son. Got it. Done. Check. Uh, go uh, tell your widow that you're going to raise her son. Got it. Go. Done. Check. Go to Mount Carmel. Fight all the, the prophets. Done it. Got Check. Done. All good. Uh, now go tell Ahab the rain's coming. Got it. Done. Go check. Now Jezebel comes along and says, hey, I'm going to take you out. And he crumbles. This guy stood up to all the prophets in the land all the false prophets who were not only cutting themselves, but were ready to cut him and everybody who followed God. And he was defiant. And he called on the name of God. And he saw that God responded to him. And through lightning and thunder and earth, and the whole thing happened. And one woman, one woman, Jezebel, comes along and says to him, this time tomorrow, I'm taking you out. And he crumbles. Get this. In your Bibles, you probably have more of a Hebrew translation, but the Greek translation of this particular verse says this. It says it's there. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, if you are Elijah, I'm Jezebel. You get the tension? <laughs> She's laying out to him saying, yeah, I saw what you did to my prophets. Watch what I'm going to do to you. And for some reason, this guy just breaks down entirely. And he enters into a state of deep depression. You got friends that are depressed? You ever been depressed yourself? I always wonder whether people who say to me, oh, no, I'm never depressed. <laughs> I'm just fine. Whether what you need is probably go see a therapist to work out what you're suppressing. Uh, because you're probably burning yourself up in some weird way. Everybody faces depression in some shape or form. But we handle it differently. Some people, when they're depressed, what they do is they go lock themselves in a room and they hide for like a whole day, or a whole month, or a whole week, or a whole year, or whatever they need to do. They hide themselves from people. Some people, when they're depressed, lash out at other people, because they just want to blame everybody else. Some people, you know, depression is caused sometimes by an imbalance, medical imbalance, a chemical imbalance that takes place, and you need some kind of medication. Other times, it's just somebody, you were just really happy, and somebody comes and says something bad to you, and just, it just kills you. My wife has often said this to me, that, that she says, why, why do you take those comments so seriously? Because, you know, I'll do something and I feel really happy about, da 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 I painted the bathroom, it's all good. Somebody comes along and says, hey, uh, that thing is out of order. Uh, that little speck of gray paint should have been to the left two inches. And it destroys me. I don't know if you're that way. Maybe you're the kind of person that you're just uh, thick-skinned. I visited some people recently who said to me, boy, Pastor, you must be so thick-skinned because you take all the criticism that people give you. And I say, what criticism? Ah, I haven't heard any. Have you? Maybe. Or maybe that's what we do to suppress the deal of our depression. Some people just eat when they're depressed. And so you're thinking, oh, maybe our pastor just eats a lot. and He's depressed a lot. Some people eat when they're happy. <laughs> I do the same. So you can't tell. Ah, all right. So depression hits us in lots of different ways. And Elijah, for some strange reason, has lost his connection with God. He's made it all about himself, hasn't he? That's what he did. Because for, until this point, he was calling on God all the time. But at this point right now, he's on cloud nine. And he's starting to think to himself, man, I did this. I'm the one who did this. And suddenly, God's no longer part of that equation. He's not leaning on God. And God then allows Jezebel to say one simple sentence to him and crush his soul. It turns out in verse 4 here, it said this, and he asked of God, he said, just, just let me die here, which depressed people often will do, right? They'll either attempt to take their own life or they just say, leave me alone, I just want to curl up and die, I want to walk in some place and just die. But truthfully, if Elijah wanted to die, he should have just stayed where he was. Jezebel would have taken care of that. No, he didn't want to die. He just, he ran off over here, gave enough distance. Now I can't die. Oh God, I wish I'd just die. Just terrible. Because he doesn't want to die. He's crying for help. And he's saying, God, I'm depressed and I'm down. And I don't understand why I'm down, but I need you to be able to do some help for me. He even blames God. 
Even though God will send an angel and feed him twice, even though our God will give him strength to last 40 days on that little bread and that water, even though God will actually say to him, hey, I'm going to send all of the images that you could ever imagine, he's still stuck saying to God, I just don't know. I feel depressed. I don't think I'm going to deal with this. So God says to him, let me help you with your depression. And maybe you can do this with others as well. Maybe you can do this with yourself as well. Maybe you can give yourself some space to be able to allow this. The first thing that God does for him in verses one to four here says this, that he lets him sit in the shade. In other words, he lets him be calm because it's important for him to be calm. And then he feeds him. When people are depressed, last thing you want to do, I mean, sometimes they don't want to eat, but you should look after whatever their needs are to make them comfortable with this. And God does this twice with him. And then, and then he allows him 40 days which is very difficult for us because we want people who are around us who are depressed to snap out of it after our one conversation. Well, it's fine. I'm with you. That's what God could have said. He could have said, well, Jezebel, I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it, Elijah. Let's go. Come on. And Elijah's like, no, no, I need time. 40 days to work through this depression. And people need time to deal with their depression as well. And then God does this. He confronts him. He says, Elijah... Why are you here, Elijah, of all things? And he listens to Elijah give him his reply, and Elijah gives him the most mundane reply you could ever imagine, and God confronts him again and says, Elijah, why are you here? And he gives the same response. Even though God has appeared through all the things that he thought he was supposed to appear, he's still dissatisfied with this, and he's still living in a state of depression. Depressed people hurt other people as well. You know that? They don't hurt just themselves, they hurt other people. They come up to you and they talk to you and they, they lash out on your soul and they have nothing to do with you or with anything going on in life or your work or your family and they lash out on you because they're depressed, because they have so much anxiety about what's going on in their life. And they're saying, I need this resolved. Well, God understands this. And so verse 13 comes along eventually, verse 15, after he gave his second reply, it says this, and the Lord said to him, after 40 days, after doing everything that he asked, after everything you could imagine, he says to him, go return on your way to the wilderness. Go confront the conflict. Go back to conflict. Go back to trouble. Go back to the risky area. Go back to Jezebel and Ahab. Just like Moses, who went up the mountain, had the 40 days, and knew that once the 40 days were done, he was going to have to come down that mountain, and he was going to come to confront the golden calf and reorganize all of Israel. Same thing, Jesus, 40 days in the wilderness, knew that as soon as those 40 days were up, he was going to have to confront all of evil in the universe. Elijah now has to understand, he's going to go on these 40 days, he's going to come down, and he's going to have to go and confront Ahab and Jezebel. So when you're depressed, you have to find out what it is that you're depressed about, and you have to confront it. You can't let something else or somebody else control what's going on in your life. You have to say, God, you have to give me the strength to confront this. It may not happen overnight. It may take months to do this, but meanwhile, you may hurt people around you, so you need to be able to be honest with God and say, God, Give me the strength to confront this, to have the courage to go do. Sometimes all you have to do is just get up and take a shower. Get up and get through the routine. Go through the day. Keep on pushing yourself through the day in order to be able to combat, combat this as best as you can. Question number three. What do we do with the parents' silence from God? This is the big one, right? This is the one, the second the second narrative inside the story, the second idea inside the story that we struggle with and we really, really wish that we understood. First of all, you have to understand this. In your Bibles, probably, and my Bible as well, says the same thing here, verse nine. There he came to a cave. In the Hebrew, it is not a cave. It is the cave, okay? There's a definitive article there telling you the cave. They understood that the cave he's going to is the same cave that Moses went to, that God called Moses up to speak to him. But this time, God didn't call Elijah to speak to him. So when God says to Elijah, and he sees him in the cave, he says to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? I didn't invite you. And what's Elijah doing? He's up there 
and he's trying to wrestle through and say, let me reconjure up what happened to Moses. Let me reconjure up what happened on Mount Carmel. Let me make sure that I can still talk to God in the same way and command and he will send fire and thunder and God will respond and I will know that I can go face Ahab and Jezebel head on because when I say, God comes at the flick of my fingers. And that's why he goes up into the cave. As he goes up into the cave, Everything that he could ever imagine that he's hoping for is going to be there right there. But here's the thing. This is the very last time in the Bible, it changed from this day forward, that God ever revealed himself through the fire, thunder, and earthquake altogether to the whole of Israel. Never again does it happen in the Bible. This is the last time. There's a shift in the entire story. And God chooses Elijah to teach this. Because with Elijah, he can then turn around and teach it to us today. You see, when we began over here, God walked down in the garden every evening and we had face-to-face -face conversations with him. But somehow, we did not like that. And we thought, no, you know, a little bit of personal space, maybe step away. We step outside the garden and we begin with, with a whole series of disasters taking place one after another. You end up with Abraham who, who in his story, as we've been studying on Tuesdays on the story of Genesis, every now and again you get an intersect. Loads of years go by and then suddenly he has a conversation with God and we're all like, ah, oh, I want to talk to God the same way Abraham did. I want to be able to hear his voice in the same way. But we weren't satisfied with that, and so the judges come along, and, and the judges say, well, I am representing God, and I hear what God is saying, and let me lead the people, and let me light up the stones, and the priests left and right, and tell you what's right and wrong, and they're like, I don't really like God telling me what's right and wrong. Not too keen on the judges. What I'd like to do is to become like that empire over there. It's as if we've got some kind of huge minority complex, and we just want to be some other kind of culture. And so we're constantly grappling for that. So they say, let's have kings, and they have kings, and the kings are a disaster. And you get all the way through to Mount Carmel here, and the prophet comes forward, and the prophet calls on God. And we love that, and we want that. It's the same feeling I have every time when there's a funeral. I feel, dear God, couldn't we just pray and resurrect this person right now? Couldn't we just have that miracle right now? Couldn't your power be like it was? Back then with Elijah, back then with Moses, back then with Abraham, back then with Adam and Eve. Couldn't we have it just be like that? And we crave God to talk to us in that way. But God is saying that he speaks here in a small, low whisper. It's not silence. It's a whisper. I mean, you read about it in verse 13. When Elijah heard it, you don't hear silence. <laughs> you sense silence. But when he heard the low whisper, he wrapped his face in the cloak and stepped out to see what was going on. He understood that God was talking to him. And here's the thing. God is trying to mature us in the way that we connect with him. It's very difficult for us today because we want to hear God's voice. We do. We want to be able to say, this is definitively God's voice. But God's saying, the method of me communicating with you has changed. In fact, it got so bad, I had to send my son down, and Jesus came down to live, to kind of re- set you entirely where you're going to go. And occasionally, I will burst in and I'll do things like I did with Saul to turn into Apostle Paul, but most of the time, I'm talking to you through a low whisper, through the community. Proverbs says there's lots of counsel and wisdom inside the counsel of many around us, through the Word of God, all the time that God is talking to you. And we have to wrestle through it. We're not beginning with no knowledge. In the time of uh, kings, did they have the First and Second Testaments? No. They relied on the, the spoken word being translated back down to them. They relied on some scrolls that had been scribbled together. They relied on that to be able to pass on their faith. Today, we have the whole Bible. Thousands of years of history collapsed together here to tell us that this is who God is and this is the God that you can trust and learn to know. And yet for some of us, it's still really, really difficult. I think it's the reason why the resurrection was really quiet. God could have had thunder and lightning and earthquakes. I mean, he did an earthquake, did that, but he didn't bring everybody in the entire city to come there. He didn't bring all of Israel to watch the stone rolled away. Only a few people saw it, and a few people witnessed it, and a few people talked about it. And even all the graves that were opened up with all the people from all ages that were resurrected at the time, it still wasn't a quiet thing that took place. Because God is saying, 
I need you to understand to stop looking for these great signs. The disciples didn't get it, of course, because when they go to Jesus, they said to him, can you tell me all the signs so I will know how the world's gonna end? And he starts to explain a few, and then you could see Jesus kind of like, whoa, 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 actually, uh, stop. Let me restart that. Let me, just, let me just go another way. Let me tell you some stories. And all the stories about you staying connected to God, about you trusting God. It's as if we want to be God. We would like to know everything so that we can plan everything, right? And yet God is saying, I need you to actually trust me that I have the game in, in hand here. Question number four, our last question for this morning. How does your faith grow? How does the faith of others close to you grow? This is a really good question, a really difficult question for us. And it kind of leads into the final section of the story here where Elijah knows that he has to pass the call on to, the faith on to, Elisha. He goes and finds Elisha. Elisha has 12 oxen, which means that Elisha was a very comfortable, wealthy person. Passes him, and he puts a cloak over him, and then he just moves on. Now, here's the thing. In leadership books, they will often talk about and encourage you to often think of a succession plan. That's what they do. They'll say, you've got to be a great leader, but you've got to think about who's going to follow you. And that's really comfortable for us. We love all the metaphors that leadership uses. They talk about, you know, when you climb Mount Kilimanjaro and you get to the very top, the air is really thin, you can survive for a little while, but then eventually as a leader, you have to come down and let somebody else go to the top. Well, P, everybody's great with that. We're all comfortable with, like, passing on the baton in leadership. Some of us are comfortable with that, but some of us are maybe don't, are not comfortable with the idea that faith has to be passed on as well. You can pass faith on. Pass faith on to your people that are close to you, Pass faith onto your kids. Pass faith onto your community as well. Like a cloak on top of Elisha, you can actually pass something on. Some of us think about our wills. I hope that if you haven't made your will, that you, have, that you will make your will. If you don't know how to, then contact one of us and we'll help put you in contact with someone. But you should make a will. And when you make a will, you think about your family, you think about your kids, you think about your relatives, you think about making sure that people are in a good place as best as they can with whatever resources you have left, you may even think about a charity, you may think about the church and money that you can leave to support it. All that kind of stuff rolls through your head. But when it comes to faith, are you passing that baton on? Are you thinking about how you pass that baton on? We struggle through that because that's really difficult for us, but yet it's really comfortable for us to talk about all the other things that we want to be able to do. We have all of our dreams for our children and for our people that are around us. I have a, you know, we have ideas of what we'd like things to go, but do we think about faith in the same way? And how, really, do you pass faith on? Do you just say, I believe, so you must believe like me? Do you leave your entire, should I, what I should do is really just take my commentary series, the four or five that I have, and all the, the, the zillion Bible copies that I have, and just leave that for my boys, Joshua and Jonah. And then, that way, faith will be transferred on. Or is there something actually more practical that God is asking me to do that's more difficult, that requires a conversation, that requires living, that requires being, to be able to pass our faith on? And do we ever think about the fact that maybe we have destroyed somebody's faith? That we have said things that actually have crumbled somebody's faith, and we need to repair those things and bring people back into a place where we are the ones who actually were negative on somebody's soul. Towards the end of this story here, there was a verse that I skipped over on purpose. It's verse 18. It's the end of the, towards the end of the chapter here. And I think this is really important because God understands what it is to pass the faith on before he gets to Elisha. He says this, yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. But the Bible in its original languages says something a little bit deeper than this. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, picks up on this. Because the Bible actually says this, it doesn't say that I, yet I will leave 7,000 here. It says, I will provide a remnant here. I will provide a group of people who you never imagined existed, the 7,000, because you thought you were the only one doing what God had called you to. And these people will be faithful to God, and these people will follow. Well, Paul picks up on this in Romans chapter 11. It's our last text for this morning, this morning. So turn with me to Romans chapter 11, page 654. Romans chapter 11, page 654. And Paul understands this because he says in chapter 10, as a lead into this, he says, because, 
in, verse, in chapter 10, verse 9. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And then he says, there's no distinction between Jew or Greek for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And everybody's excited with this. And everybody believes. Because they believe in God and trust God, they know that he has the salvation. And everything's good for them at this point. But then verse 14 comes along. Now then, with four questions, how then will they call on him who they have not believed? These are our people that we need to transfer our faith onto. These are people in our community. This may be even us sitting here in the pews. And how are they to believe in him whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news? Faith comes from the word of God. That's where it comes from. You can read all the books in the entire world You can read every great autobiography, every great historical artifact you could find. But if you haven't read the Bible, you're not gonna discover God. You're gonna discover glimpses of God, little segments of God, but you'll never discover the whole picture of God. You have to read the Bible. When you get to chapter 11, which is the chapter I wanted you guys to focus on and maybe mark up in your Bibles as well, it says this. He says, look, I know you're feeling maybe we've been rejected or something like this, but verse, verse 3, Lord, they've killed your prophets. They've demolished your altars. I alone am left and seek my life. He quotes Elijah. He says, but what is God's reply to him? This is what Paul says. I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So to are the present time. There is a remnant chosen by grace. Not a remnant who actually know all the truth. Not a remnant who feel that they have everything nailed down but a remnant that God has chosen by his grace and laid on them the responsibility to go and share, to go and deliver the good news to the whole world. If we're going to trust God and embrace him, then we have one responsibility to actually spend real time inside this book. And I know that for some of you today was probably the first time this week that you read the Bible. I mean, read the Bible, where you heard me read it and you read it yourselves. And it can be sometimes a bit confusing, a bit difficult to get through. But believe me, if you're stuck and you don't know how to do this, that's what your elders and that's what your pastors in this church are for. Come talk to us and let us help you recapture who God is in this entire book. Because when you do that, your faith will grow.